job. Okay, we're going to be continuing our series on the conscience. So if you open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we'll read from verses 4 to 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, read from verses 4 to 13. To be sharing God's word with you again. We shall welcome to our visitors. If you're here for the first time, we hope you're blessed by the service and by the sermon now as well. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4. That's concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols. We know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat... Are we the better? Neither if we eat not, are we the worse? But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee, which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to the idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish, for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll commit this time to him. Father, we thank you once again for your precious word. We thank you that we can trust it. We thank you that you've preserved it for us. And we thank you for the many men who have laid pen to paper and have faithfully transcribed your words, Father, that we might have them and learn from them. So we pray that our hearts and our minds would be open to your truths today, that you would use me as a simple instrument in your hand, Father, teaching your truths and nothing else. We thank you for this time, we thank you for this place, and we pray that we would um, treat it with the importance that it has. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Christians in our day often fall into an error of believing that we live in absolutely a unique set of circumstances that previous generations have never experienced. The sin we see around us, which often um, grieves us in our culture, um, is not something that's unique. They're they're the same sins that have been committed 2,000 years ago are still being committed today. Being a believer in Paul's day, if you came from the Gentile world, for instance, you were coming out of a culture that was purely pagan, if you can understand that, purely pagan. So can you imagine growing up in a world where there was a multiplicity of gods being worshipped? I suppose if you you come from an Indian background, you probably appreciate this a little bit more, okay? Um, Because India still has a plethora of gods they worship. But if you were coming at, or had, were a believer, or became a believer in Paul's day, you would have most likely grown up in a pagan society. Your whole culture revolved around worshipping all different types of gods and sacrificing to all those different types of gods. With generations and generations of your ancestors having built those traditions into their own custom, okay? So imagine growing up and all you knew from a child was celebrating not Christmas, but the worship of the sun god, okay? Not Easter, where we celebrate, where, where, the, where Christianity celebrates the resurrection of Christ, but the, uh, the worship of another god, the, 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 the birth of another god, Uh, And you were worshipping gods like Zeus and Jupiter and Mercury and Diana and all these other gods that were common. And so 
You might have had your own personal God that you were devoted to, and maybe your family's favorite God you probably had in your own home, a corner of the house with an idol there that you would regularly pray at and offer sacrifices to. Okay, So imagine you were coming out of that particular life, and that's all you knew. And then there's this thing called Christianity that's lying around and people are talking about this guy called Christ. And sure, you might have heard about the Jews who were these, uh, these people, a small group from the Middle East somewhere um, that always insisted that there was only one God and that they were the only ones that worshipped him, pesky people. But they were crazies and zealots, okay? Because everyone else knew that there were a lot of gods around. So these guys were just plain wrong. But if you became a believer in those days, if you found out that Christ was the Son of God and you put your faith in him and you got saved, I wonder what, what you would come against. What challenges did a new believer have to face in those days? Well, essentially the same challenges that new believers face today if you come from a family that's non-believing. The main difference being that today, much of the world knows about Christianity. Much of the Western world is actually, has actually been founded upon Christian principles. Okay? And so it's sort of common in our day to know about it. The majority of people know about Christianity, or at least some things, and it's becoming less and less with time because they've managed to, to remove as much of it as they can from our culture. But if you were coming into, a, if you were a believer in a world that was completely pagan with no knowledge of Christianity, how would you cope in that world? That world was ignorant of your faith, no knowledge of Genesis and Leviticus and the, the history of God uh, and how He had chosen His people and how He had worked. Imagine if all your family was pagan. And all they knew was that. Imagine you lived in a world where the government was the supreme authority and had authority over you. And if they wanted to throw you in jail and kill you, they could at any time. Imagine living in a country or living in a place where the emperor was a god and you had to worship him and offer sacrifice to him. That's the world that we're talking about when the Apostle Paul is writing these letters. Christianity was either outlawed or seen as a dangerous cult that was an off a dangerous cult that was an offshoot of Judaism. They saw Christianity as a perversion of Judaism, which they sort of tolerated, okay, because Jews would keep to themselves, okay. But now you've got a dangerous offshoot of Judaism, which is not just keeping to itself. It's actually going around winning converts. It's going around spreading this type of uh, doctrine all around the world. And you've heard news that these people do stuff that's, that's altogether sinister. I mean, these people, they drink blood in their ceremonies. They eat the flesh of their own, of the guy who apparently saved them. This is what was spreading around the Roman Empire. So what happened when you got saved in this type of world? Well, persecution probably come. Okay, um, What happens if you rejected the teachings and the religion and the culture of your own family? Maybe they had believed the same thing for hundreds of years. Okay, um, What happens to that? What happens if you're a believer in that world? What happens with your conscience? Now, we've been talking about the conscience okay, in those days. How do you work with your conscience? I mean, when everything around you revolves around a different system of belief, where paganism is permeates through every part of it. Um, we're going to look today at what advice the Bible gives to those who had to make daily choices in their lives. And we're going to learn from that uh, advice. And what would you do if you were uncomfortable about things that were going on in your own family. Well, do you go to the next birthday party? Do you go and celebrate their Christmas or their 
their next uh, religious festival. What happens when your whole family goes to celebrate as they would every year to a religious festival? Do you not go? What happens at the next wedding in, in your family when someone gets married, but the wedding ceremony revolves around another God? Do you go to the wedding or do you stay home? You see, they experienced probably more than we experience today. They had a lot more challenges. And on top of that, you had this issue where churches are being planted, okay, and you had Jews coming into that church. Like, imagine our congregation here, our local flock. Imagine that you had half of the congregation were Jews. They got saved out of Judaism, okay, and then you had the other half that were Gentiles. And you came with very, very different customs. You came with very, very different backgrounds and expectations. And so the Jews came in with all their rules and regulations that they'd been brought up with, but the Gentiles didn't have all those rules and regulations. So they're coming in and doing stuff that the Jews are finding, ah, that's a little bit dodgy. Why are they dressing like that? Why do they speak like that? Why don't they actually wash their hands before they eat? Don't they know that that's actually a really bad thing? So you've got all this stuff going on within the church as well. And so the challenge we have in our church is actually probably less than what they had in the, in, in the early church. But we're going to see in all of these considerations, we're going to see and we'll be looking, okay? It is about worshipping God. The part of worshipping God is how we treat each other. Because if we do not know and understand how to treat each other with love, then, you know, all that stuff about raising your hands and enjoying worshipping God, that doesn't mean very much at all. Because if we can't love, as according to the Apostle John, if we can't love one another, we can't love God. If we can't love the ones that we can see, he says, how can you possibly love the one that you can't? And so loving one another is supreme in terms of what God has called us to do. In fact, it's it's the second commandment, which is the, holds the most importance, which is loving him first. But in loving him, we are called to love each other. So we're examining this aspect today of how we influence each other in terms of the conscience. So turn back to First Corinthians. But to us, there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So the sacrifice of food to idols in Paul's day was commonplace. You need to understand how this was a standard practice Okay, in those days. The whole world was pagan. The belief in many gods was commonplace and was standard. And the worship of idols was widespread. Like I've said, most people had idols in their homes Okay, that they worshipped. You couldn't go to the supermarket like we do today. So when you go to the supermarket, the last thing that's on your mind is thinking about, was this pork chop or was this scotch fillet sacrificed to another god? Do you think that? No. But in those days, most of them were. Most of them came through that system. Okay, And also, the marketplace was filled with food that had been sacrificed to idols beforehand. It was a normal thing. In fact, it probably, I suspect, was a selling point. Because if you were devoted to Zeus, for instance, and then it came through, and then that meat that was sacrificed to Zeus was sold in the marketplace, hey, you'd probably go for the Zeus one, wouldn't you? Rather than Diana. So it'd probably have a big Z stamped on the meat. And you'd rock up to the, uh, the, to the supermarket and you'd say, any, uh, any Zeus meat over here? Yes, we have uh, prime scotch fillets over here on the side. Yes, I'll have that one over there. Why would you do that? Because you're devoted to your God. And you want to please your God. And because you're devoted to your God, you believe the more you're... It's the same thing as religion today. The more you do for your God, the more you sacrifice to your God, the more you, the more you, uh, you obey your God, the more blessing you're going to get back. Okay? So it was commonplace. I mean, today... 
people stamp halal meat, don't they? Or you can buy kosher meat, and then if you're, you know, you can buy organic stuff as well. Okay, you can have meat that's stamped, that's got that's GMO free or you know or organic or something like that because it sells, doesn't it? There's some people who want to buy that specific type of meat, and so you stamp it with all these things. And if you're really smart, you'd stamp halal, kosher, organic, and GMO. Get everyone happy. Well, some of you picked up the problem with that, did you? So the problem is now that Greeks and Romans and Asians and people from all different places, right, we're now converting to Christianity. And so you've got this, the Apostle Paul going around with other, with other disciples, planting churches all over the place, including people like Apollos, uh, all over the Roman Empire. And, and suddenly this is becoming an issue, right, because more and more people are turning to Christianity. They're turning to the Lord. They're getting saved. And so for new believers, um, becoming active uh, for the Lord now put them in a bit of a bind because they may have been very active beforehand, worshipping another god. They may have been completely devoted to Thor. Remember the guy with the hammer? They might have been completely devoted to Thor. Okay, and they might their whole life might have revolved around Thor and how wonderful he was and how powerful he was and how he gives me such strength, you know, to overcome all the obstacles in my life. And now all of a sudden you've turned against that. You realize Thor is a fake. He's only an actor. He's an Aussie, apparently. Okay. <laughs> he wasn't even. <laughs> um, and now all of a sudden, like if I see Thor out there. If I see Thor, you know, the meat stamp with the big T on the top, what do I do with that? If I had devoted my whole life to sacrificing and serving this God and, and, and doing all that stuff, now I'm finding myself having rejected all of that, I'm most likely going to hate that now. Yeah? I remember when I, when I first got saved and I, um, and I was a, came from a Catholic background, and one thing, you know, being zealous without wisdom is a problem. And everyone who gets saved, first of all, is filled with zeal for the Lord. There's an excitement. There's a whole new life. There's all that sort of stuff. But that zeal often comes without temperament. And so I went on the full-scale attack. Okay? That which I had done my whole life... I now absolutely hate it with all of my being. I was lied to all of those years. They've sent all my relatives to hell. They have corrupted the Christian faith. They are doing things which is contrary. They are doing to, to the word of God. They, are, they have taken pagan principles and inserted them into God's pure faith. Mate, I was on the rampage. And after having been on the rampage for a little while, I realized that I was causing more problems than good. You can't go on the rampage without actually ruining some other people along the way. And so the, one of the challenges that I had was while I was telling my, um, my relatives that the Pope was the Antichrist, it wasn't exactly coming across too well. Um, so my advice to you, first of all, is if you're going to share the gospel, if you've come out of something, yes, y y we know it's wrong, okay? And we know there are plenty of people who are living in darkness because of false faiths and false religions. Um, but if you go on the attack and attack someone's faith that they've grown up with and that their whole identity revolves around, don't expect to pull the rug from under their feet and have them feel good about it, okay? And you might even tell them the absolute truth. But the thing I've found in my life over the years is not everyone's ready to hear the truth. You can blurt out all the truth in one go, but not many people are ready to understand the truth. It's not only true for people who aren't saved, it's even true for people who are saved. 
They struggle sometimes to accept the truth. We hear often what we want to hear. And so we have the situation. If you were a, a Gentile that had come out of a pagan thing and your whole family was devoted to it, now you begin to hate what that, what that represents now and you see it dragging your family into hell. Or if you were a devout Jew that was so caught up with all the dietary laws and all those things in the Old Testament that God had given to his people and you believed in everything had to be done in a particular order and you had to, you couldn't uh, mix up your meat and your milk and you couldn't do all these types of things that they try and do today. Now all of a sudden, you know, you're saved by Christ and all of a sudden these things don't really, they're telling you they don't matter anymore. How do I not do those now? And so in holding these memories, some people struggle with that, especially in the early years when you're saved. How do you, if you've got the memory of those idols that you used to worship or, or, or you, you used to do something in a certain way and all of a sudden now you're invited to you know, a family party, you're invited to a wedding, you're invited to a funeral, you have to go to a funeral. And you know that funeral is going to revolve around another God. The wedding is going to revolve around the other God. And then everything is going to revolve around the other God. Do you go to those things? What do you do? Do you eat the food that they put in a feast in front of you? You see, none of those things would have been very easy for new believers, especially. And so, if they hold those memories, and while you're trying to go about your daily life, you find yourself confronted with a world that doesn't know Christ, you can't go to your local butcher anymore as you had done all those years before because your local butcher was devoted to Zeus or to Diana. I can't go to the same guy I used to go to and buy my meat anymore. What am I going to do? How do you feel about buying your, your favourite scotch fillet and throwing it on the barbie now? Do you feel uncomfortable with it? Do you stop eating meat? And then you've had conversations with people in church and brother someone so tells you, you know what? I've had enough. I can't deal with it. I'm not going to eat meat ever again. I'm just going to stick with vegetables. That means you've got to give up hamburgers, sausage rolls, meat pies. Oof, mate, that's a big one. But then how do you deal with all that? Some, maybe some of your friends said, I'm not going to go that way. Others said, no, no, I'm going to, I'm going to keep on going that way. But they're feeling guilty about it. And so these people are caught in a dilemma. There's a conflict in their conscience. And the question is, does the one who abstains from eating the meat, does the one who has a problem with eating the meat, does that person have a strong conscience or a weak conscience? Because the Bible speaks of both. Well, let's see what it says. Look at verse 4 say again. It says, 1 Corinthians 8, 4 says, As concerning therefore the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world and that there is none other God but one. Okay, so let me just, just unpack that for you for a sec. In verse 4, Paul states clearly that though the world may believe in many gods and have many lords, we know how many are there? There's one. We know that. And how many lords are there? There's one. There's only one Lord, Jesus Christ, and there's only one God. So what does that make all these other gods? Well, it makes them all fake. It makes them all false. And the idols that represent those gods are fake as well. Okay, Because if the God is fake, if he's just an actor, and he could even be a devil acting, okay, he's just a fake God. And the truth is that idols and the gods they represent are to us nothing. They mean nothing. They are simply trickery, foolery. Okay? They hold no power over us. They cannot influence us. They cannot uh, bind us. They can't do anything to us because we worship the one true God. They are merely the imaginations of men and the trickery of devils to distract men from God. Do you know that old trick about, you know how they do the, the sleight of hand stuff? They keep this hand moving over here while this hand's doing all the all the stuff, right? 
So they, they keep you focused over here while, while the magic, in inverted commas, while the trick is actually happening in the other hand that you're not looking at. And this is exactly what idols are. There's a whole lot of trickery. Look over here. Look over here. Let me distract you from what's going on up there. The true God. And so the, the truth of the matter is, Paul is saying, idols are nothing in this world. They hold no power and we should not be afraid of them. We should have, as believers, no fear of any idol. It cannot do anything to you. It has no power over you. It cannot, even though people may worship it as a God, Paul says, but we know there's only one God. And that's not a God. So in summary, it's all fake, including the sacrifices offered to them. And the teaching is clear. Now, Paul says in verse 7 then, how be it, but there is not in every man that knowledge. Okay? Not everyone's got that understanding. For some, with conscience of the idol, so their, their thoughts are of that idol, unto this hour, eat it, the food that's offered to it, as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Did you get that? He says not everyone understands this teaching. But when they eat the food, their conscience, which is thinking about, oh, that food was offered to that idol. They eat it, but they defile their conscience because it's weak. Because they're more concerned about the idol and what the food or who the food was offered to. And so their conscience witnesses against them that they're doing something wrong. And they stain their conscience. They carry the remorse and the guilt. Remember the conscience got the accusing figure? The finger, it's, a, it's the witness against if you've done something wrong. And so their conscience tells them you've done something wrong. You've, you've eaten food that's been offered to an idol. So let's follow the argument though. Paul's saying, because I don't have the correct knowledge, they see it as a thing offered to an idol, and it affects them. And Paul continues with the, with the argument. In verse 80, he then says, But meat commendeth us not to God. What you eat doesn't make any difference to God. It, he says, Neither if we eat are we better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. Eating meat does not commend us to God. It does not offer us, it does not make God say, what a wonderful person Frank is because he ate that meat or if he didn't eat that meat. It doesn't cause God to approve of us because we did not eat all that we, all we ate. Eating doesn't make us a better person and abstaining doesn't make us any worse. Eating is, is not a means to holiness and not eating is not a means to holiness either. But a person whose conscience is confined in that particular way, who has a problem with eating meat, should they eat? The answer is no. They should not eat. Because if they're worried about eating, it's not a good thing to defile your own conscience. Because in their mind, they're committing a sin. But the one that believes in eating a food sacrifice and idol is a sin has a weak conscience, not a strong conscience. Why weak? Because Paul says they lack the knowledge. Remember what conscience is with knowledge? Okay, so some of that knowledge is not right knowledge. Okay, and so it's the word of God that has to then re-educate your conscience. So Paul says they have a weak conscience because they lack the knowledge that Paul speaks about. And their conscience is easily defiled and guilt-ridden. A weak conscience, if I had to liken it to something else, anyone has a, has a phobia here? Who's got a phobia? Come on. Seriously? Five of you got a phobia? All right. Those honest people, I'll, I'll give you a... Uh, a treat after um, okay so most people know what a phobia is and if you've got a phobia you understand what I'm what I'm what I'm about to say and how I'm about to describe it a, a phobia 
is an unrealistic fear of something. I've had people who, who are afraid of birds. Okay? Birds. So if a bird is anywhere near the vicinity, they're afraid. Now, I'm not sure what they're afraid of. Maybe, the, maybe they've seen that film, The Birds, and the bird comes and plucks the eye out and stuff like that. But there's an... Okay, so is, is, it, a, is it a normal thing to be afraid to walk down the street because a bird's going to come and attack you? Most people would say, no, that's not realistic. But then people have fear of spiders, okay? People have fears of snakes and people have fears of... There are phobias all over the place, okay? There are phobias of, you know, people are afraid even to... There's a phobia about eating muffins, apparently, <laughs> that they'll get stuck in your throat. Yeah, there's, there's, um, there are phobias of literally everything. People have fears of going outside their home. People have fears about driving cars. People have... Okay, so... For all the normal people out there, right? You're saying to yourself, oh, come on. How can you be afraid of a bird? Right? I mean, I've walked down the street all my life and I've never been attacked by a bird, except for the guy who's been hit by a magpie on his head. And, uh. But the, the point is this. A phobia is classified or defined as an unrealistic fear. Okay? Is that person who is afraid of bird have knowledge or they don't have knowledge? Or is that knowledge corrupted in some way? And most people would argue that the phobia is a corruption of knowledge. It's an overemphasis on something. Okay, does that make sense? And that's like a weak conscience. The weak conscience is overemphasizes like having a phobia about something it has a fear about something because it doesn't necessarily understand the truth and so paul says they have this fear when they eat something that's been offered to an idol and in them they're doing something wrong and paul says but that idol is nothing in this world and they defile themselves because their conscience condemns them. So a weak conscience can be defined as an overly sensitive conscience. Now, I'm sure that there are plenty of overly sensitive consciences in this room. Okay? And some consciences that are under-sensitive. You see, we're all at different places in our walk in our maturity, and in our learning from the Word of God. But a weak conscience is, in the Bible, defined as an overly sensitive conscience that calls something that is good or something that's neither here nor there, like Paul says, eating meat doesn't do anything for you, as something evil. And so you're affected by it, and it condemns you if you do it. But there's a lesson for those who have the knowledge of the truth, though. So, okay, so we've defined the person as a weak conscience, but what about the other guy who says, I haven't got a problem with eating, and he goes ahead and eats the food and goes to the marketplace and buys the meat with the big Z on the top and goes and does whatever he has to do and goes to a party here and goes to a, a, a wedding there and he's not fussed about it. What about that person? Well... How was the relationship between those two brothers in Christ? Let's look at verse 9 to 13. So this is the brother that's free. So this is when you see the word liberality, this is the brother that is free to eat. Okay? So 1 Corinthians 8, 9. But take heed, be careful, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see thee, which hast knowledge, remember that knowledge he was talking about? Sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died? But when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, look at what Paul says, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth. 
lest I make my brother to offend. Now that's a massive thing, statement he's making. If it's going to offend my brother, if my brother struggles with eating um, food offered to Zeus, and in his mind he thinks it's wrong, okay, I'm not going to eat that meat in front of that brother because I don't want a situation where he looks at me and says, well, he's doing it, I'm going to do it too. But still he hasn't accepted that truth yet. And he ends up condemning himself as a result. The truth is exercising your liberty in Christ may mean that you, pro you provide a stumbling block to your brother, to the one who has a weaker conscience. And it means that you sin not only against them, but against Christ because you have not considered their position. And if they don't have that knowledge, which doesn't mean they might not have heard it, but it means they might not believe it yet. They haven't received it. They haven't accepted it. If they don't understand the truth or the freedom that they have in Christ, then flaunting your freedom in front of them means that you're sinning against them. And you may be causing more harm than good. And the whole thing about, oh, don't worry, you'll be all right. Just come along and, you know, and we'll enjoy this thing together. Paul says, uh -uh -uh, just hold on there. Don't push them to go doing something against their conscience. Because you may be harming them. So who has knowledge, this knowledge, may be able to sit at an idol's table and be perfectly at peace but may cause another person who is not perfectly at peace to copy him and cause that person to die on the inside. And Christ, he says, died for them. How can you destroy his life like that? So Paul's advice here is that you have knowledge that your brother might not have or maybe hasn't understood or maybe hasn't accepted. Good. Fine. You've got that knowledge. You've got that freedom. And he says, be careful for your brother. And so you, with the liberty, with the freedom, you're called to restrict your freedom. You're called to hold back your freedom. So what's more important? Your freedom or your brother's conscience? Your brother's conscience is more important. You see, in our world, your personal freedom is the most important thing. You are the most important person. Your freedom is the most important thing. And no one has any right to tell you what you can and can't do. And in our world, that's true. But in God's economy, that's not true. In God's economy... My first concern is not my freedom. It's my brother's conscience. It's my brother's walk. So I will happily, as Paul says, restrict my freedom in order that I might not be a stumbling block to someone that I love. And that's the point. It's about love. And we should be sensitive toward the weaker brother's conscience. But inherent in all this, there is a call to also educate one another. We are not to leave our brother ignorant. We are called to share what the truth is. It's always the case in the word of God. We should, but the question is whether they have accepted that or not. You see, once again, we're all at different places. <laughs> Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 27 with me. 1 Corinthians 10, 27. Because Paul doesn't just address this in 1 Corinthians 8. He addresses this same problem in a number of, in a number of his letters. And so once again, he repeats the same thing. 1 Corinthians 10, 27. It says, if any of them that, look at this, that believe not, bid you to a feast. So this is a friend or family that invites you over to uh, a party, okay, where there's going to be food. And ye be disposed to go, so you want to go. 
Whatsoever is set before you, what does Paul say? Eat. Just eat. Asking no question for conscience sake. But if any man, he says, say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols. Eat not for his sake that showed it. And for conscience sake, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, not your conscience, but of the other. For why is my lib liberty judged of another man's conscience? For if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of for that which I give thanks? So you may have been invited to a, a family function, someone's birthday party. We're going to have a party for brother so-and-so or uh, sorry, an unbelieving okay, family member. And you think, oh, I'm going to go. I want to go and spend some time with them. Maybe share the gospel, or that sort of stuff. And so you say, I'm going to go. So Paul says, well, when they put the food down, they even bother to ask. Did you sacrifice this one to someone else or what? Don't even bother to ask. If you're free, you're free. Just eat and don't worry about it. He says, but if someone comes and tells you, like a brother, another brother that's there, this food was sacrificed to idols and it's affecting him, Paul says, don't eat. For the sake of that one brother, he says, hold back on that because you don't want to ruin his conscience. So you, once again, Paul says, you restrict your freedom for the sake of your brother's conscience. So if a Muslim or a Hindu or anyone asks you to a feast and you are accepting of this doctrine, then go and eat without a problem. But if a brother says to you, I know that's, that food was sacrificed to some other Hindu god to Shiva or someone like that, and they've got a problem with that. He says, "Don't, don't eat it, for his sake." So, what's more important, your freedom and your ability to have a good time, or your brother's conscience? He says, "Your brother's conscience." Now, it seems almost counterintuitive, doesn't it? It seems almost how, how can you live like this? How, how can I do this? Because it's normally not what we would think to do. Because, and I'll tell you why we think like that. Because our society is self-centered. It's all about a person's personal rights. It's not about loving my brother, which means putting them before me. Paul says rather, don't go. Don't eat, because it will provide the weaker person the motivation to actually also judge you. You're going to be tempting them to actually judge you. And in this case, he says, they're going to be sinning, as they've allowed their conscience to judge another person's freedom. See, so he says, for if I by grace be a partaker, so if I, by the grace of God, enjoy and am happy to enjoy this food, which I give thanks to God for, it doesn't matter who it's, who it's actually sacrificed to. I'm giving thanks to God for this. By God's grace, why am I evil spoken for of for that which I give thanks? Paul isn't arguing that they have no right to judge you. Paul's saying that though I might give thanks for the food provided by the grace of God, I shouldn't open the door for my weaker brother to say, how can he do that to me if he doesn't understand? How can he do that? How can he eat that food? If he does not understand, it's better not to put him in that position because he's going to be put in a position to judge you. And so I've caused him to once again sin. And Paul says, don't provide an opportunity for division between you and your brother. Because if I eat, there's an opportunity, if my brother does not understand what I know, to actually cause us to become divided. And Paul says, don't do that. You see, the one who is strong is called to be strong on behalf of the weak. The one who is strong in the faith can be strong to forego his freedom or her freedom. They can give up the freedom. The other one can't 
they're locked into a position. And so the one who is strong, the one who is free, is called to bear the burden of the weaker brother. We are called to bear the burden of the weaker brother. The stronger has more regard for the weaker brother than himself. Turn to Galatians 5.13 with me just for a moment. Galatians 5.13. Galatians 5.13 says, For, brethren, he's talking to the brothers and sisters in Christ, ye have been called unto, what does he say? Liberty. Freedom. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Don't let your flesh take a hold of that liberty and decide to take you somewhere it's not supposed to go. But what are we to do with our liberty? But by love serve God. One another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. What are we called to do with the freedom that we have in Christ? Yes, I can eat anything, drink anything. I can celebrate any day that I like and not celebrate any day that I don't want to have. Or I don't want to do. You're free to do whatever. But in all things, we are called to consider one another. And to limit our freedom for the sake of the weaker one. For the sake of love. Because love always looks out for the other person before I get mine. For those of you who are parents. And you have your children around you. Do you look out for them first or for yourself? You look out always for them first, right? Your mind is always on them. Why? Because you love your children. And your children, who are weaker than you, you don't want them to stumble and fall. No one likes to see their children go through pain and suffering. They don't have to do. So you've constantly got your eye on them. Why? Because of love. And this is what we are called to do for each other. We are called to love each other, keep an eye on each other, because I don't want you to fall. And so what I do is I restrict my freedom as all good parents do, okay? If parents didn't have kids, what are you going to do? You're going to stay at home and then... You're not. Every parent restricts their freedom for the sake of their children, okay? Why? Because they love them. And so this is what we are called to do for each other. And especially if you're strong in the faith and you have the freedom to do whatever you want, you understand the liberty that you have in Jesus Christ today, you are called to keep an eye out for your brethren. And you're called to restrict your freedom for that sake. Actually, Jesus says that people will know that we are his disciples by the love that we have one for another. Now, how are people going to know the love that we have one for another? Because it becomes obvious. It becomes obvious that we are looking out for each other, that we love one another, that we put each other first before ourselves. What we are willing to bear for one another is a mark of how much we love each other. If I am not willing to bear anything for you, if I'm not willing to restrict my life for you, then how can I say that I love you? But the true is the same is true for you. If you don't restrict your life for your brethren, if you don't alter your own life for the sake of your brothers and sisters in Christ, then how can you actually say that you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? What shows it? How does it? How do you prove it? What? Because I've got a fuzzy feeling when I'm with them. We all know that love is not that feeling. I'll give you an example of what I mean. If a brother um, who just got saved had a problem with alcohol during his life, okay, and was an alcoholic, 
And after much strain and trouble and trial and all the things that he went through, okay, um, finally managed by the grace of God to overcome that weakness and sin in his life. Now me, who has the full freedom in Christ, has no problem having a beer. But if I know my brother was an alcoholic and by the grace of God has been freed from that, how responsible am I for my brother if I'm happily drinking alcohol in front of him? Is that love? No. And this is exactly what we're talking about. If someone has a weakness in some area, I'm not going to flaunt my freedom in front of them. In fact, I will drink no alcohol at all. In fact, one of the things as a pastor, and the pastor has a responsibility, is that I understand that with every person that comes in this church, there comes in people with inherent weaknesses, struggles that they're trying to overcome. Some of them may be alcohol. For that reason, I will not drink alcohol for their sake, whether I know it or whether I don't. I have, do I have the freedom to drink it? Yes, I do. There is no restriction in the New Testament that says thou shalt not drink alcohol. There is none. There is a restriction about getting drunk. Getting drunk, the Bible says, is a sin where you lose control of your faculties. But there is no restriction in the New Testament about drinking alcohol. But yet, for the sake of the brethren, I will not drink alcohol. And the reason is twofold. One, I may tempt a brother who is weak in that area to drink alcohol with me. And what I might be able to handle like that, he may end up going home in a terrible state. And the other aspect of it is, is that there are younger people looking to me as some sort of example, correct? Is that wrong? Nothing wrong at all. Okay, But if a young person who's never had a problem with alcohol, who's never tried alcohol even, then becomes emboldened to have it, and then I become the reason they become, or they have a problem, whose fault is that then? Well, it says it's mine, really. So Romans 15, verse 1. Turn with me there. Romans chapter 15, verse 1. Paul summarizes for us this attitude we should have toward each other. Romans chapter 15, verse 1 to 3. It says there, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak, the weaknesses of the weak, and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbour for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. Even Jesus, who is our perfect example, restricted himself so that he could bless other people. Was Jesus free? Yes, he was the freest person on the planet. In fact, he was the, the author of life, the creator of the universe. If anyone was free, it's him. Yet, he restricted himself to a mortal body. He restricted himself to living a life according, under the authority of a family, of Joseph and Mary. He restricted himself to follow a particular path that was going to lead him to suffering and death. Did he restrict his freedom? Yes. Who did he do it for? For us. He's our prime example. And so we have this passage. If you go back to, you can, you can stay there. So 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, it says there. Neither to the, actually, I'll get you to turn there because I think it's an important thing to understand. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 to 33, it says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do, first of all, for God's glory. And then it says, Give none offence, neither to the Jews, 
nor to the Gentiles, and then he says, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. We are called to do everything for God's glory. Living lives that cause not offence to anyone, whether they're Jews or whether they're Gentiles. That's not even saved. Because then he says, don't cause offence to anyone in the church as well. So he's saying, in your life, do not live a life that causes offence to them. So if I'm speaking with a Muslim, I'm not going to eat a pork roll in front of them. I'm not. Why? Because if I'm trying to share the gospel with a Muslim, he's going to be focused on what I'm doing. And it will distract him from the message that I'm trying to give him about love. If I can't restrict my life for the people around me for the sake of the gospel, then I've got no love for anyone. What does it mean to live for the glory of God? It means that we are to restrict ourselves for the love of other people. Not just the brethren. In fact, the brethren above everyone else, but for all men. And Paul says, I seek to please all men in all things. Paul's saying that. And if Paul's saying he's seeking to please all men and he doesn't want to offend anyone and he's restricting his life so he can actually share the gospel because that's the most important thing to him, then we, my brothers and sisters in Christ, should do the same. It's not about seeking our own profit. This is not about us. You see, there's a mentality in our, our churches today that it's all about my growth. It's all about me developing. We spoke yesterday at the men's meeting about setting goals for ourselves. And the majority of goals that are set by Christians don't revolve around other people. They revolve around themselves. My Bible reading. My prayer time. My development. My learning. It's all about them. They're the center of everything. Instead, it shouldn't be about us. In fact, it shouldn't be about us at all. It should be about living for other people, seeking to edify them in the faith, seeking to help them to grow, not being a stumbling block to anyone else around us. When a person is free in Christ, let me ask you this morning, are you free in Christ? Are you really free? Because if you're really free, then you have everything. Why are we so afraid to lose things for the sake of others then? If you're really free, why are we so afraid? The fact of the matter is, we're not free. We're not. We play the freedom thing, but then the moment someone says something, oh, someone's done that, we get afraid and get worked up. Because they might be touching my freedom. Touching my freedom? What freedom are you talking about? I have all things in Christ. I have a future that no one can touch. I have a Savior who walks with me every step of the way. Who can touch me? What can they do to me? Can they kill me? Hey, I'm home. Can they restrict me? Can they put me in jail? Praise God that I'm counted worthy to suffer for his name. Praise God. We should live our lives for the glory of God in everything. And that means living a life that restricts our own freedom for the sake of other people. So turn to Romans chapter 14 with me as we close with this passage. Because if you are born again today, if you are saved today, and Christ is in your life, then you have a reason to live. You have your purpose in life, and that's him. You have everything you need for daily joy. Do not live in fear. Rather, use your freedom for the service of God. Romans 14.1 says, Him that is weak in the faith, and this is the other, other aspect. Now, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye. Accept the person who is weak in the faith, but not to doubtful disputations. They go arguing about stuff that's not important. For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eats herbs. Let not him that eateth 
despise him that eateth not, and let not him that eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. Yea, he shall be holden up, for God is able to make him stand. One man esteemeth one day above another. Another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. I am not to judge you about what days you celebrate for God. And neither are you to judge me. We are not to judge each other about what we eat, what we don't eat, what we do. Unless we are breaking an obvious command. Look at verse 13. So it says there in conclusion, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. But judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably, which means with love. Destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. Let, let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that, is, that, that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Let us therefore follow after the things that make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offence. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that commendeth not, condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So, how, does my, how, does, how do I influence your conscience? And how do you influence my, my conscience? What, well, in many ways, it looks of it, it looks like it. And it's important that we understand that we ought to live with a clear conscience before God. But we don't do it alone. Okay? We have to do it together. We have to do it supporting each other for that very thing. We should all be careful not to put a stumbling block in front of someone else's way. We have to be careful about our behavior, not because something is a sin if you do it necessarily, but because it may cause my brother or sister to fall. And in all things, we are called to love one another. Nor should we be quick to judge one another if they don't do something the same as us. You see, each one of us has a personal list of standards that we try to keep. The moment we say that your, standard, your list of standards has to be the same as mine, makes me what? Makes me God. So we should all be looking to keep our eyes on Christ. There are some things that are more important than food, drink, festivals, and other things like that. And it's the soul of your brother in Christ and your sister in Christ and the person who is not saved. So let's keep our eyes firmly on our Saviour. Let's remember we don't live in a vacuum and everything we do affects the brother and sister sitting next to us in church. Okay? And let's understand that if we have freedoms, use your freedoms for the glory of God. Okay? God bless you. Let's close in a, um, let's close in a final hymn. Turn in your hymn books to 187. And we'll close in a word of prayer after this. Let's stand. Who knows this hymn? Blessed be the ties that bind. Some of you know it. Please sing loudly with me then.
187. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. On to before our Father's throne, we pour our ardent prayers, our fears, our hopes, our aims, our one, our comforts and our cares. On three, we share our mutual woes, our mutual burdens bear, and often for each other flows the sympathizing tear. On the last, when we asunder part, it gives us inward pain, but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. Blessed be the tie that binds. And that tie is the Lord Jesus Christ who has brought us together in him. So this morning, if you know Christ as your Saviour, God bless you. Remember to keep your eyes on Him. If you don't know Christ this morning, if you are not saved, or if, you, if you're if you not sure about whether you're saved, then today is a good day to find that peace with God, who you can only get through Jesus Christ and receive as a gift. So this morning, I'll encourage you all to uh, to turn your eyes upon Jesus. Okay, Let's close in a word of prayer. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the grace that flows from your throne each and every day. We thank you that it was your grace that has saved us, and by your love you sent your only begotten Son into this world to rescue sinners such as us. We thank you for the gift of salvation that we enjoy today because of that immense sacrifice that was made for us, the atonement that was offered at Calvary for our sake. We thank you that by his blood, our sins have been cleansed and we have now called your children. Father, I pray that we would love one another as you have loved us, that we would indeed be careful about the way we live, not just in front of each other, but in front of this world, that our testimony would be sure and true, that the words that we speak would be spoken in love and that we would reach out to this world because there is much darkness within it. Help us to shine our lights and live in a way where people see Jesus in us. Bless us as we depart and we spend some time together in fellowship now. We thank you once again for your word, for the fellowship that we have here in this place. And we pray that you bless us until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you all. You're dismissed.